as you as it has me. Good morning, friends. How's the 11 a.m. crowd today? How you guys doing? Doing all right? Always good to see you. Welcome to those of you joining us online from wherever you're joining us from. It's always good to know you're there. We're in for a great day today. Today we're finishing up our series of talks on heroic moments that we see in Scripture. And today we're talking about a woman named Priscilla who answered the call of God in her life and stepped out of comfort and into unfamiliar territory. I love this story about her. We're gonna learn a lot together. We're gonna start along those lines. We're gonna start with this song that says, God, because of your love, you make us brave. So if you're able to, would you stand up and let's declare this beautiful truth together.
seated, turn to someone next to you, tell them you're glad to see them, give them a high five or a handshake. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Kensington. If you are joining us on stream, you are with the Troy campus. For all of us here in the room, welcome, everyone. You all doing well this morning? Fantastic. Good stuff. Good energy. Good energy. Hey, if we haven't met, my name is Andrew. This is Elsa. And again, welcome to all of you. Yes, you should get, you get a lot of like woos and a lot of claps. And so that's true. As you should, as you should. No, no, that's good. You should get a lot of them. And so, hey, we're really, really glad again that you are joined with us today, that we can be connected in this way. And Elsa, it is almost August. It's crazy. But yet, school is just around the corner. For kids, and for those of you who are kids in the room, that's probably not good news for you. But parents, probably great news for you, but maybe for some of us, and so not me, but other people. <laughs> but hey, there's a lot of things that are happening at Kensington right now, and one of them is happening in a week and a half. Yes, that's right, Pastor Andrew. So we're having baptisms, and I don't know if you've all been to baptisms, but they are so special. It's an opportunity to see powerful testimonies of lives that have been transformed, but also there's like unique moments, and I love it, when I've gone to um, baptism, I've seen a proposal being done afterwards. I've seen a baby dedication. And then I saw best friends that got baptized together. So invite your family, your friends to join us August 9th yeah. at 6 p.m. We're going to have dinner. And your kiddos can bring their bikes because they can bike around the parking lot. And there's going to be a course. But there's also dinner as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask staff that are wearing badges. But also check out our website, too, to get more information. Absolutely. And it's not just for uh, kids, for the bikes. If you really? are an adult, uh, hey, you know I what? We, my bike we said it at nine. Okay. And so if you are an adult and you want to crush those four-year-olds in this course, feel free to bring it. And you can do that. And you can be that person as well. But hopefully we will see you on August 9th as well. And hey, today we are in the fifth and final week of our series, Heroic Moments. And in this series, we've been looking at some incredible leaders all throughout the scriptures. People like the prophet Elijah, Deborah, Samson, Peter, and we're going to be looking at another amazing, amazing person, and her name is Priscilla. And every single one of these people that we've been looking at, they truly were difference makers in that God used them to do, ordinary people, to do what is truly extraordinary. And they were difference makers exactly like we're going to see in this video, in that every single one of these people, they did great things. So let's take a look at this together. Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and started a mass protest which led to the end of segregation on public transport. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran pastor who was consistently outspoken in his criticism of Nazism in Germany. Preferring to stay in the country of his birth, he was eventually arrested and executed in 1945. 
During World War I, Edith Cavell, a nurse in Belgium, was arrested and executed for helping Allied servicemen escape back to England. Shortly before her execution, she said, Patriotism is not enough. I must have no hatred or bitterness towards anyone. We climbs up on the hill, on the rock on which he stands. He looks back at the crowd, and he looks down at his hands, and he says, I am a difference maker. Yeah, I am the difference maker. Oh, I am the only one that speaks to him. And I am the friendliest of friends of God. Well, he walks up on the hill, on the rock on which he stands. back at his hands and he says I am a difference maker yeah I Pakistani schoolgirl defied threats of the Taliban to campaign for the right to education. She survived being shot in the head by the Taliban and has become a global advocate for human rights, women's rights, and the right to education. Maximilian Kolbe was a Polish Franciscan priest. During the Polish occupation, he was arrested twice by the Nazis but continued to offer shelter to the Jews and Polish refugees. In 1941, he was sent to Auschwitz concentration camp, where he volunteered to take the place of a man condemned to death, showing great courage, faith, and dignity. I'm on the fence about nearly everything I've seen, and I've felt the fire be put out by too much gasoline. We're all strangers passing through space and time and afternoon. Life is but a vision in a wind. It's a passive confrontation about who might throw a punch or not. We are all transgressors, we're all sinners, we're all astronauts. So if you're beaten dead, then raise your hand, but shut up if you're not. Cause I gathered to protest a KKK rally in Michigan. They chased down a white man wearing a Confederate flag t-shirt, knocked him down and started hitting and kicking him. An 18-year-old girl, Keisha Thomas, threw herself on top of him to protect him from the angry mob. Last picture of Nelson Mandela. He's an incredible, incredible 
person, incredible leader. And it just reminds me of his story because I'm reading his autobiography right now, The Long Walk to Freedom. And it's the longest book, let me tell you, that I have ever listened to or read, but his story is extraordinary. And he did extraordinary things. God did extraordinary things through him. And as we saw that video, there are some incredible people in that video. And when we look at that and we see those stories and we're reminded of their lives, we wanna be exactly like them. Because every single one of us, we want to be difference makers. We want our lives to count, to not only to do something great, but also to inspire others towards greatness as well. And every single day in our world, there's greatness that happens all around us. And last Saturday, I was having a conversation with some friends about a moment of greatness that we had all witnessed the night before. And it's centered around a person named Lionel Messi. And if you don't know who Messi is, he is an Argentinian soccer player, and he is considered to be one of, if not the greatest soccer player in history, the best. And he recently signed a contract to play for a US soccer team called Inter Miami for between 50 to $60 million a year. That's his salary, in addition to all of the other money that he makes. And so as you can imagine, there was so much anticipation and there was so much celebration when he signed this contract. And before he even stepped onto the soccer field, he was having a massive impact on the city. There were restaurants who changed their menus to include messy themed dishes. And this is one of them, right? This is called the Messy Burger. Haha, <laughs> do you get that? Right, the Hard Rock Cafe actually rolled this out. But in addition to all of the dishes and the restaurants, there were murals and pictures and signs of Messi that popped up all over the city. This was outside of a restaurant. Ticket prices for the team went from about $40 for a single game to more than 300. And mind you, Inter Miami is the worst team in Major League Soccer. And they also went from having around 1 million Instagram followers to almost 11 million after he signed with them. It was the Messi effect. And so as, as I mentioned, there was so much anticipation for how is he gonna do, right, for his first game. Is he gonna succeed like he did in Europe or is he gonna be even better or how is this going to go? And so the day finally came around for him to play his first game and he didn't start the game, but he checked in in the 54th minute. And at the end of the game with just a handful of minutes left and he's still playing, that the score was tied 1-1 and he got fouled toward, uh, towards the top of the penalty box. And so what was happened was, was that with the eyes of the world squarely upon him, and we have to understand, there were tens of millions of people watching this game all around the world. He lines up to take the free kick. And everyone is wondering if once again, he could do something great again. Is that he could have this huge impact if he could author another unforgettable moment in an already unforgettable career. And if you saw the highlights, you understand that he just took two casual steps and he drills this ball over the wall into the top left corner of the net. And when he scored, everyone who was watching, whether they were in the stadium or at home, they just went nuts. And I could even hear the announcer, that announcer who says, goal! And he's just yelling this. And when you actually look at that, and you look at what happened that night, we couldn't have even written a better story because he won the game for his team. He ended up being the hero. And every single one of us wants to experience a moment like that, that we wanna have an impact, we want to be a difference maker. But for many of us, it feels like this just isn't possible because we're ordinary, and that we don't have the talent or the skills of a Messi. We may not have the courage of a Malala Yousafzai, or the leadership abilities or the intelligence of a Nelson Mandela. But the great news is, is that for all of us, God has created us with the capacity for greatness. And greatness, not as the world sees it, but greatness is defined through the eyes of God. And so today what we wanna do is that we're gonna actually be leaning into a story in the scriptures of a woman named Priscilla and unpacking what does this actually look like in our lives, in your life and in mine. That we are ordinary people, but yet through this story we're gonna see how we too can be a part of something that is truly extraordinary. And so as we continue on, would you join me in prayer? So God, thank you. Thank you for this amazing and beautiful community, Lord. Thank you that we can be connected whether we're here in the room or whether we're watching on stream somewhere around the world. And thank you most importantly that we can be connected to you. And so as we look at the life of this person named Priscilla, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak, would speak to us and speak loudly to us, give us ears to hear and eyes to see 
Lord, and a heart to understand how you are leading us and prompting us to move closer towards you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love for us. And we pray all these things in your powerful, powerful name. Amen. And so also as we continue in the service, I also, we wanna take a moment to receive our offering. So ushers, I wanna invite you to come forward. And I wanna say, if you are somebody who does partner with us, or maybe today, maybe the very first time you're jumping in to doing this, we wanna say thank you. Because when we give, really, it goes to impacting so many people's lives, just not only within our community, whether it's our children, our students, people in this area, but also people all around the world as well. And so thank you for that. And we actually just had a team come back from Kenya this past Friday, and the things that they witnessed there were truly extraordinary, and that they witnessed a well dedication. And every single well that goes in is able to provide clean water for a thousand people who otherwise didn't have that, and now they do. And it's not just their lives that are changed, but generations to come as well. And this is the impact that we're able to have when we partner together like this. And so if you would like to give today, of course, you see the baskets coming around, but there are a number of other ways, as you see on the side screens. We can scan the QR codes that are there. We can also text the word Kensington to 77977 as well. And we can also give via the website or the app. And if you are somebody who does give, thank you for your generosity and thank you for your open-handedness. And so today we're jumping into the story of a person named Priscilla. And Priscilla was one of the most prolific missionaries in the New Testament. And we're introduced to her and her husband's story because they're very much intertwined in the New Testament book of Acts. And this is how it introduces them. And this is what Luke, who wrote these words, says. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. And Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. And so just to give us some context as to what was happening at this time in Rome, in that Rome had become a turbulent place. And the reason was, was that the Jews in that city, they were upset that this new belief system that was focused upon this person named Jesus was starting to gain traction. And so what they did was that they started persecuting Jesus followers. So there were uprisings and riots, but probably most importantly, the peace of the city of Rome was being disrupted. And the emperor at the time was a guy by the name of Claudius, and this did not sit well with him. And he just wanted this gone. He didn't want to have to deal with this problem. It was just a pain for him. And so he really didn't care who was innocent or guilty. All he knew was it's the Jews that are behind this. And so he issues this wide-ranging edict kicking all the Jews out from Rome. And he said, just get out of here. I just want you gone and done with. I don't want to have to deal with this. And so he kicks all of them out, including Priscilla and Aquila. So imagine being them. Imagine even us here, somebody issuing a law saying, hey, you know what? If you're a part of this race, if you're a part of this ethnicity, you can't live here anymore. And having to leave friends and loved ones, homes, jobs, our, our entire lives behind. And that's what they had to experience. And so they move to this city, this nearby city called Corinth. And it was there that they met a man named the Apostle Paul. And the reason why they came together and why they were able to connect with each other is that they did the same type of work and that they were both tent makers. And so they start working together, but in addition to working together, what Priscilla does is that she opens up her home and invites Paul to stay with them, and they became fast friends. And about a year and a half of after doing life together, Priscilla and her husband Aquila join Paul on one of his journeys around the world to share the message of Jesus. And this is what it says as we pick up the story in the book of Acts. It says that Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, and then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sancria because of a vow he had taken. And they arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So all three of them, they were headed to Syria. And they make a pit stop on the way there in a city called Ephesus, which is now in modern day Turkey. And we have to understand, Ephesus wasn't this tiny, nowhere town. It was one of the largest cities in the world. Think London, think Tokyo, think LA, that type of place. And it's there that they stop. And basically what Paul does is that he leaves them behind. He ditches them in some ways. And this is the thing, that if you ever go on a short-term trip with Kensington, 
Maybe you might go to Kenya, Israel, Nepal, India, the Dominican Republic, wherever it is. I promise you, we will not do a pall on you and just leave you behind. Although maybe some of you may want to be left behind because you'll meet some of the most incredible people in your entire life. But we buy round trip tickets for a reason. But that's not what Paul did. He leaves them behind. But in all seriousness, there was a very, very important reason why he did this. Because there was a church, a young church community that was rising up in that city of Ephesus. And he wanted Priscilla and Aquila, these two amazing leaders, to stay and invest and support and encourage that community. And it's in the city of Ephesus that Aquila and Priscilla, that they meet this person named Apollos. And this is what Apollos, we're introduced to him again in the book of Acts. It says that meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. And he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew the baptism of John, which is important for us to keep in mind. And that he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. And when Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. And when he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public, dis- public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. And so when we learn about Apollos, we learn that this guy, he had a lot going for him, right? He was passionate about Jesus. He was bold. He was a great communicator. And so people just came, flocked, because they wanted to listen to him. But this was the thing. As we read, it says that he only knew the baptism of John, which meant that he didn't have the whole story, that he believed that Jesus the Messiah was still to come. Not that he had come, had died, had been raised again to life and returned to heaven and changed everything as a result. He didn't know this. And when Priscilla and Aquila realized this, they very easily could have had this air of superiority. They could have thought to themselves, we're not gonna listen to this guy. He doesn't even know as much as we do. He doesn't even have the whole picture and they could have just walked away and given up on him. And this is the thing that for every single one of us, we know people like this and we hate being around them because they're arrogant and pompous and because they, they may know more because they may have more experience or expertise, skills and abilities in a certain area. They think they are here and everyone else is down here. But Priscilla and Aquila, they didn't do this because they understood that this understanding of God that they had, the message of Jesus that they had wasn't a secret for them to hold onto and hide and feel superior to those who did not know. But they understood that God had called them to share it with everyone around them, especially those who had never heard, so just like them, that they could have their lives transformed. And this is exactly what they did. Because just like they did, just like Priscilla did for Paul, she opens up her home to Apollos, invites him in, and not only into her home, but into their lives, and explains to him this life altering, history-altering event that had happened. And the approach that she took and they took with him wasn't critical, it wasn't demeaning, it wasn't condescending, but rather they lived out how the Apostle Peter tells us to communicate the message of Jesus in the New Testament. And this is what he wrote. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. And then he tells us, this is what I want you to communicate. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So he's saying, I want you to communicate the message of Jesus. He gives us the what, and then he tells us the how. And this part many times is forgotten because he says, but do this with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. Because what God challenges us, invites us to do, is that he tells us, I want you to communicate my message of hope, love, joy, and peace to everyone around you, not just with your words, but with your actions, with your decisions, with your entire life. And here he says, I want you to do this with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. And if if you are a Jesus follower, can you imagine if Jesus followers in this country and around the world actually did this with gentleness and respect, I truly believe that we wouldn't have the reputation that we do around the world 
being judgmental, being hypocritical, and as Gandhi said, looking very little like the one that we say that we actually profess to follow, which are some of the most heartbreaking words. He says with gentleness and respect. And this is what we see that Priscilla and Aquila did with Apollos. And he had his life, life transformed. And then God, through him, transformed the lives of so many others. And he became one of the great leaders in the early church. And after this, the story of Priscilla and Aquila goes quiet for a little bit, but their names we see pop up at certain points in the New Testament, including in a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church community in the city of Rome. And this is what he actually said about Priscilla and Aquila. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my coworkers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles, meaning people who are non-Jews, are grateful to them. It's a powerful statement. Greet also the church that meets at their house. So what we see is that they continue to open up their home to people to come. They have an open door policy. Whatever was theirs, they give it away. And people just come and come and come. But Paul also says, they risked their lives for me. And we don't know what they did, but we do know that they put everything on the line for him. And this is what we see about their story over and over and over again. And as a result, God used them in incredible, incredible ways to be able to proliferate and to communicate his message way back in the first century AD all around the world. And when we look at Priscilla specifically, she was an ordinary person like you and me in that she couldn't fly, she didn't have super strength, she didn't have 200 million followers on what I like to call the TikTok, right? She didn't have any of this kind of stuff. But she was an ordinary person. She had a job, she had a home, she was married, she had strengths and abilities, great strengths and abilities, but also she had flaws and mistakes and she made mistakes and this was who she was. But one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons why I believe that God was able to do monumental things through her is because she chose to live her life like this, in just an open-handed way. She was open-handed with so much of what she had and did. And this is also one of our core values here at Kensington, this, open-handedness. Understanding, rather than holding on to the things that we have like this, that we would joyfully as a community, not reluctantly, not begrudgingly, but rather we would joyfully give everything that we have to the plans and purposes of God, understanding that all that we have is his anyways. And just as we've been freely given all of these things, that we would freely give them all away. And somebody who has modeled this so well for us throughout our entire history was one of our co-founders, is one of our co-founders, Steve Andrews, and he led our community for decades. And there are so many stories of Steve actually doing this, but one of the stories that I was told, and this happened before my time, but it was so unique that it's always stayed with me, was that on one particular weekend, Steve met a person who was starting a church just down the street. And some church leaders, understanding this, would feel threatened and would want to try to keep their resources and not want anyone to go to that church community and not want anyone to give their resources to that church community. But what Steve did was that he met this person in between services and then at the next service, and this room was absolutely packed, he brings this person up on stage and introduces him and says, hey, you know what? This person is starting a church down the street. And so if you live in this neighborhood, don't come here, go to this church. Don't give here, give to this church community. And have you ever met a leader do something like that, let alone a church leader? And it was because I truly believe that Steve, what he understands and what he models is, is that the kingdom of God is so much bigger than we could ever understand or imagine. And it is not a zero sum game, which has allowed him to do this. And this is also what we see with Priscilla over and over and over again. And that she opened up her home to people like Paul. And also, wherever her and her husband found themselves, in whatever city around the world, that that church in that city would meet in their home. In addition to this, she shared her business with Paul, the tent-making business. And she also continually gave away her knowledge, her expertise, the information that she had gathered over her entire life, investing in the lives of others, people like Apollos. It was a life lived in such a radically open-handed and living like this is something that I have really struggled with over my lifetime. And I was actually reminded of this this past week. Because this past Wednesday, one of our neighbors had to take um, her mother to the ER. 
And her mother was visiting from another country and so she was having some health issues so she was rushed to the ER. And her husband was working late that night and so, she, so they asked us, hey, can you watch our kids for a little bit? And our kids get along great. They almost play together and hang out together almost every single day of the week, so often. And so we said yes, but the ER being the ER, it was taking a lot longer and so it looked like they would actually have to spend the night and when I, when I found that out, I got so grumpy. And my wife texts me, I'm here. And Robin texts me and I'm like, oh, really? And I had a terrible attitude. And I was grumpy because it meant that I would have to change my plans that night. And I was grumpy because I knew that having all of these kids in my house, it was gonna be chaotic. And when I got home, I was grumpy because these kids have been playing outside the whole day and they're all sweaty and smelly and gross and they're planning to sleep over. And I'm just thinking in my head, you are going to mess up my clean beds. It's so I had the worst attitude. And so later on that day, I had to go and get pizza for dinner. And while I'm driving, I was reminded of what the conversation that we were gonna have today, of what it looks like to live a life like this. And I felt so convicted and frankly, I felt embarrassed and ashamed because when I actually took a step back and realized why I was in a bad mood, I was in a bad mood because I had to open up my home to children whose grandmother was in the ER. That's why. And just in case you're keeping score at home, yes, I am a terrible, terrible human being. Absolutely. <laughs> That's how I felt in that moment. It's like, what is wrong with me? Yes. And so this is the thing, right? And as I mentioned, I've struggled with this for so much of my life, and God has been stretching me, trying to teach me, trying to teach me that everything that I have, whether it might be my possessions, my finances, my skills and abilities, the experiences, the influence, the status that I have in this world, that ultimately I'm not an owner of these things because it all belongs to him, but rather I'm a steward and I'm an asset manager. But also probably the more difficult lesson that I've been trying, that he's been trying to teach me is to trust him, that when I live a life like this and things actually go out, to trust that he sees and that he will provide, not necessarily what I want, but every single time what I need. And as I've begun to do this, and trust me, it's been so slow of a process, as I've begun to do this and slowly open up my hands more and more, what I've experienced is that this is the most freeing and joy-filled way to live. Because when we live like this, we're imprisoned by fear and worry. That when things go out, we're so worried and we're so stressed that, oh my goodness, what's gonna happen? I need to get more and more and more. I need to hang on to the things that I have even tighter so that they don't go out and I feel secure and I have control. But rather, when we live like this, that we are able to participate with what God is doing and how he's using the resources that we have in our hand to create beauty all around us. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so this is the thing. I know I'm not the only person who struggles with this in some area of our life. And this is the question that I wanna ask all of us today. What would it look like for us to take a step towards doing more of this? And if we are here, moving towards here doesn't happen overnight, but it's a journey, it's a process where we take step after step after step. What is the step that God is inviting us to take today or this week? Maybe like Priscilla, it's opening up our home to the people around us, whether it's to our neighbors, to our small group, whoever it may be, and not just opening up our home, but also inviting people into our lives and to do life together. Maybe for others of us, it's meeting regularly and intentionally with that person at work who has been asking for our time and saying, hey, you know what? I wanna learn from you. And finally, setting up meetings so that this can actually happen. Maybe for others of us, it's jumping in to a team here whether it's operating a camera, serving coffee, greeting, investing in the next generation, whatever it is. But what is that step for us that God is inviting us into today? And something that my wife Robin said to me years ago, and she's probably one of the most generous and open-handed people that I know, is that she said to me that out of all the times that I've chosen to live like this, I have never, ever regretted being generous or living in an open-handed way. And if we look back at our life, I think we can say exactly the same. I know I can because this is the best way to live. And that's exactly what we see with Priscilla. She lived like this and God was able to do monumental things in her and also through her as well. But at the same time, let me also say this, that when we choose to live like this, not only is God able to use what is in our hands to create beauty all around us, but at the same time, he's also able, it also allows us to receive more of what he has for us. 
Because when we come to God like this, he has good things that he wants to give every single one of us, but he can't fit it in. And he's like, trying to, it's like pry our hands open to fit better things in. And he can't because we're holding on to the things that we already have so tightly. There's no room for anything else. But when we come to him like this, he is able to give us better things and greater things that we could ever understand or imagine. This is what we see with Priscilla's life. Priscilla gets moved around to all of these places. Starts in Rome, goes to Corinth, goes to Ephesus, back to Rome at some point, and some other cities as well. And that God placed in her hand not just movement in terms of physical location, but he also placed in her hand different adventures and experiences and open doors and opportunities. And so much of what we see with her life is that when God placed these things in her hand, it was yes, 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 yes. There may have been uncertainty, they may have been new, they may have been challenging, but what she said was yes to the things that God was putting in her life and putting in her hand. And as a result, there were so many incredible things that happened. And again, the world was impacted by her yes. And I know that for so many people here in this room and watching on stream, that this is how you have lived your life for so much of your life like this. And as I was thinking about stories to share today, there was one person in particular that came up in my mind and she actually came to mind on Monday and it's a woman in our community named Peg Omen. And she has lived her life, her and her husband Phil have lived her, their lives like this. And so let's check out her story right now. Phil and I have three children and four grandchildren. We were at a point in our lives in 2009 um, that, you know, we were empty nesters. We travel a lot, we love to do that. Love to spend time with our family. We were having a great life. It's probably started in 2009. I really felt just God nudging me and saying, you know, like, what is it you're doing with your time? Could you be doing something that would make a bigger difference for me? And so um, he was really starting to speak that into me. And I was feeling like dissatisfied all of a sudden, which I hadn't before of what I was doing for my work. And um, just kind of feeling like, okay, there may be something more God wants me to do. And then I got a phone call. Karen Nicholas uh, from Kensington Church. She called and said, how would you like to go to Kenya? She expressed some interest, but very quickly declined uh, because she had another obligation. And I think she was kind of relieved that she was off the hook. Phil and I had already booked a cruise and it was the exact time that the Kenya trip was. Um, so right away, I just thought, well, I'm not, I don't need, I don't have to go. <laughs> Because of some schedule conflicts, we had to change the date of the trip. And as soon as I found out that the date was changed, I called her again. Immediately on her phone call, I started making lists of why I can't go. A lot of things went through my head. Um, first of all, could I even do it? I mean, um, physically, I have some heart issues. So I have a pacemaker. Um, I have a major artery that's blocked. One of the first things Phil said to me is you need to call your doctor at Cleveland Clinic and ask him if it's, it's okay for you to go. So I thought, well, I'll email him because he's an extremely busy uh, surgeon. He won't get back to me in time and I won't have to go. <laughs> so um, sent him an email and literally 40 minutes later, he sent me back an email and said, you're great. Just take your medicine, you know, rest when you need to and you'll be fine. I actually picked up my Bible and it was one of those things, okay, Lord, I'm gonna open it up and if you've got something to sh you know, tell me, I need to see it. And it was Moses talking to the Israelites saying, you know, what does God require of us? And it was three things. It was like, listen, obey, and then love God and love other people. And so that was pretty much a clear message to me that um, I needed to listen, I needed to obey. I just said, okay, God, I'm going. And I called Karen and I said, all right, buy me a plane ticket, I'm going. <laughs> From the time we touched ground, there was something about Kenya that just made me feel like I was at home. 
It was just this whole moment of just thinking, this is where I'm supposed to be. That's why they're looking at my fingernails. <laughs> and we saw my toenails. I think for me, it was watching them have so much joy and they have absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. Some of them have only the clothes on their back. I knew God had something for me in Kenya. I didn't know what it was. I actually came home and at that point decided um, that I was gonna change, you know, what I, how I spent my time. And I didn't even know what that was gonna look like. So once we got back from the trip and we launched the child sponsorship program, we were ready to bring staff person on. And so I invited Peg in and I asked her if she would be interested in the position. She um, prayed about it and she accepted the position. I had already been praying about it. You know, I'd already been, I already knew that that's what God wanted me to do. It was the whole reason he wanted me over there. Kensington launched No Child in 2010. I think at the time we had a few hundred children. Um, that has grown in Kenya uh, itself to over 725 children. We call it No Child because we believe that no child should die of starvation, uh, be without an education, have not have medical care, and especially the, every child needs to know about Jesus. I've been coming for five years, so I've seen what the children's homes were when we first started No Child, and then I've, I've see it today, and there's been so much improvement. And because they're being fed, and they're being clothed, they're doing better in school. You're gonna make a great teacher. So the kids are achieving better scores. We have so many kids now that are going on to high school and even university, so it's been exciting to watch that happen. There's so much potential in these children. I see so much joy and love, and um, I just, I love seeing that come out in them. I feel like I'm home. When I see their faces, it feels like home to me. And when I'm at home, I long to be here. I feel like I have a thousand children. <laughs> I went from an empty nester to having a thousand kids. There's no greater joy than knowing that you're living in obedience to God. And so we have Peg Omen in the flesh with us. <laughs> and I don't know if you noticed, but that video was actually, um, we filmed it eight years ago. And so again, you and Phil have an age today. And so you guys have to, in addition to- Andrew needs class. <laughs> in addition to like everything that you're doing with No Child, you should sell your jeans. And so <laughs> your non-aging jeans. Um, but this is, the, this is the incredible thing. Like you provided some statistics about No Child in the video, but it's been eight years. And so No Child has grown in not, in only, not only in terms of geographic location, but the size of the impact that we've been able to have. And so I'd love for you to give us an update. Sure. When we first started No Child back in 2010, I think we started with four or 500 children total. And, um, you know, that was exciting. It was scary to think when we came back. Because when I was in Kenya, the, some of the first of that video was yeah. the first time I was there. Um, there was also a team in India. And so we came back. We launched in 2010 in May with a fear of, oh, gosh, what if we don't get these children sponsored? But um, God has been so good. And since 2010, so 13 years, we have had over 5,000 children go through the No Child Sponsorship Program. Incredible. So Incredible. it's exciting. Yeah. And because No Child, and just for us to put that into perspective, because No Child has been around for so many years, and exactly how long has it been? 13. 13 years. In that some of these children who were sponsored at the very beginning, they now are grown up, they're married, they have children of their own. And so the impact that No Child has had is not just on one generation, but it continues on to other generations as well. So you're not just a mom, you are also a grandmother as well, which is really I incredible. I need to be a great grandmother, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Probably maybe pretty soon, in a couple of years. But as we saw in your story, that you guys, you and Phil were at a place where you are empty nesters and you are looking, hey, you know what? We have no kids in our home and we could do what we want and move in whatever direction we want. And then this is placed. And you guys are literally cruising and going on cruises and vacations and all of these things. And then God places this in your hand and into your life. 
And of course, it was a whole process and a whole journey. And there was fear and there was worry and stress. It's like, what, what should we actually do? Is this, is this the direction that we're supposed to go? But yet, ultimately, you said yes, and you had your life changed, and you impacted the lives. God has been able to impact the lives of so many others. And so for somebody who is sitting here or watching on stream, and they are in the same place that you were in 13, 14 years ago, and that they have an opportunity that God has placed in their hand and their life, and they're wondering, what should I do? What would you say to them? Well, the quick answer is just say yes to Jesus. Uh -huh. But, you know, with that comes, even though when I did say yes, out of all the fear, you know, some of the fear was still there, but what I loved watching in my own life is God just went before me. He prepared the way. He made it much easier than I thought it was going to be, and, um, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity. You know, like the sponsorship provides so much for these kids. The biggest thing for me is that we get to introduce all of these children to Jesus, and I've had a front row seat watching their spiritual development. And uh, that's been so amazing. Um, I think if I would have said no that day, I would have lived a life of regret. Sorry. No. But by saying yes, I've been able to live a life of gratitude for what he has done in these children's lives and in the communities that we work with. That's amazing. So it's just say yes to Jesus. Yeah. And what I hear you say is that the yes isn't always easy, but at the same time, there's so much beauty on the other side. And that's what I've been able to see in your life and in No Child. And it really has been this powerful, powerful ministry that God has really launched and had just impacted children all around the world. And so the story of No Child is really incredible. And so for somebody who's sitting in the seats or watching on stream, and if they wanna jump in and they say, hey, you know what, I wanna sponsor a child, maybe I wanna sponsor 10 children, how would they actually go about doing that? That'd be great. Um, yes, so we have a website connected with Kensington. It's called nochild.org. You can go there, you can see um, different children that need to, are still in need of sponsorship. We have about 400 right now that actually need a sponsor. Uh, we're also out in the lobby today, so um, you can see some of the kids who need a sponsorship. You can read their stories. We'd love to invite you in. Thank you, Peggy. And so really the challenge today is what does it look like for us as a community to live a life like this? And that what is in our hand to allow God to use those things to really build his kingdom and to create beauty in this world in a greater way, but at the same time, also as he places opportunities in our life, which is exactly your story and so many of our stories, what would it look like for us today to say yes to that and move towards him and move towards saying yes to that opportunity that we would be this type of community? And so thank you for leading the way in that and showing us a beautiful example of that. And so as we close out the message today, would you join us in prayer? God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for Peg's story. Thank you, Lord, through No Child, Peg and Caitlin, Lord, and so many others. The incredible impact, Lord, that you've been able to have in the lives of the next generation, Lord, all around the world. We are grateful, God. And we know, and I know, Lord, that for every single person, Lord, watching and in this room today, that you desire to use us in similar ways to just create beauty in the lives of others, Lord. And so as you are prompting many of us, we pray that you would give us the courage to be able to say yes, because it's not easy. But thank you, Lord, that you are patient, that it's a journey, that it's a process of moving towards open-handedness and to show us today, Lord, what that step is for us as individuals and as a community. We are grateful. Thank you, Lord, for your love and care for us. And we pray these things in your son's powerful name. Amen. Well, I know that many of us are both encouraged and challenged today. We end our time together. We're just going to sing a song that says, God, yes, I'm available to you. And if you're able to or if you're compelled to, you could stand with us. And I would even encourage during some time during this song, if you want to, just to go ahead and put your arms out, your hands out like this and say, yes, God, I want to live my life open before you.
Are, these are holy moments when we say God we open our arms to him our hands to him and we say God use us how you want to use us and sometimes that begins us on a journey that we could never see where we would go we would never know the people that we might connect with even, even today maybe some of us will connect with a child in Kenya Build, build a relationship, change their life. They'll change our life too. But whenever we say yes to God, it does begin us on a journey. And so many times it connects us with people that are different from us. People that have very different stories. People have different backgrounds. And that's the beauty. That's the beauty of saying yes to God. I was thinking about a verse today in the Old Testament. It says, declare the glory of the Lord among the nations. Declare among the people of the nations of the world what he has done. And so as we say yes to God, that's so many times what happens. We're able to share the goodness of God, the greatness of God, who he is. So if we end our time today, we're going to sing one last song that just honors the goodness, the greatness of our God, the King. And what we like to do around here so many times is sing it in the languages of the nations. So we're gonna sing in three different languages today, starting with English, and this song goes way back, so some of you might know this song. If you do, sing it with us. It just goes like this. The splendor of the King Clothes in majesty That all the earth rejoice That all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice Trembles at his voice Sing this out Sing how great is our God Sing with me how great is our God Yeah. 
So just as this song, as we just heard it in this song, that was the whole point of the series. It wasn't about the greatness of the people, but about the greatness of God shining through every single one of these people. And so as we go today, that, that we would do the same, that we would live this type of life, which provides God the room to be able to do what he desires to do through us and impact the world. And so when we go out, drop by the No Child table. Also, our prayer team will be down front for anyone who would like to receive prayer. But thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for streaming, everyone. Have a great rest of your weekend.